All right, Janelle, you're up. Thanks for. Uh... Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to uh, this four part series, which will take place over the next four Wednesdays, in which we will discuss the upcoming holiday season. I should say it's really the um, it's really the the current and upcoming holiday season because um, we're gonna today we're gonna talk about current, not just what's coming up. But the truth is we are now less than a month away from Rosh Hashanah, and really once you do get to Rosh Hashanah, it is a mad dash as we make our way through Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, followed by Sukkot and Simchas Torah. So um, that's why it's best to spend time in advance preparing ourselves for the, for the holiday season. And even though it's, um, they're separate holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, followed by Sukkot and Simchas Torah, even though they are technically separate holidays, we make different blessings for each one, different mitzvahs for each one, it is very clearly a connected sequence. And it's a, it's a ladder, just like many areas of Judaism. Every day, the davening, interestingly, we have... Um, we are told that the davening every day is compared to a ladder. We say the davening is compared to the ladder of Jacob's dream, which the Torah tells us, V'hine sula mutzav artsa v'rosho magia ha-shamayma. The ladder was uh, resting on the ground, and um, the, in Jacob's dream, he sees a ladder whose feet are on the ground, and its head, v'rosho magia ha-shamayma, and the head of the ladder is in the heavens. And our sages tell us even that the ladder had four rungs on it. Somehow there's this idea that within Judaism, the ladder that begins from the, on the, that rests on the earth, there are four steps to heaven. And while it's not the topic of today's discussion, we are taught that in prayer, the daily prayer, the morning prayers, there are four general stages, which allow us to begin the davening as we are on the ground, again, just having woken up. And then by the end of the davening, or by the time we reach the Amida, um, we are already with our head in the heavens. We are able to have a, a closeness to God. And perhaps it can be said that the, uh, the holiday season is the same way in which we have um, the upcoming holiday season. Really, you can, you can divide it into four in numerous ways. You could say it's Rosh Hashanah, followed by Yom Kippur, followed by Sukkot, followed by Simchas Torah. Or as we're going to do it, we're going to focus on Elul, which is the, today's discussion, followed by Rosh Hashanah. And then follow the third class will be on Yom Kippur. And the final class will be on uh, Sukkot and Simchas Torah. So this is, the, uh, this is the idea, but the goal being that we start on the ground. We start where we're at after or in the, in the middle of a summer, which, you know, perhaps somewhat of a self-centered reality. And we move upward to a closeness to God through the holiday season. So today we're gonna to talk about Elul. Elul is the month we are in now, the month which precedes Rosh Hashanah. It is, you can call it the final month of the year, the 12th month of the year, if you start from Rosh Hashanah being the first, or as you may know, we also sometimes calculate from the month of Nisan, from the month of, uh, of Passover, in which case Elul would be the sixth month of the year. But anyway, this is the month we are in, and it is the month in which we are meant to prepare ourselves for, for uh, the upcoming holiday of Rosh Hashanah. You know, they say about a guy who's in court, and um, he's being tried for a crime, which he claims that he didn't commit. And uh, at a certain point, after a long uh, period of time, he stands up in front of the court, and he says to the judge, he says, Your Honor, I'd like to change my plea from not guilty to guilty. <laughs> so, the, so the judge looks at him and says, now? We're, we're, we're a month into the system. If you believe, if you know, if you thought you were guilty, why suddenly now are you telling us the truth? So he says, to be honest, I thought that I really didn't commit the crime. But now having heard all the evidence against me, I'm beginning to think that maybe I'm guilty. So maybe, you know, one can have this approach to El. El is the time where we, uh, you know, as we get ready for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's the time where we start taking all the evidence against ourselves of the past year and we start feeling guilty. We want to change our plea. I used to think that I was innocent. Now, God, I realize that I am actually guilty. But that's really a mistaken approach to Elul. There are those who have that approach. There are those who look at it and say, you know, Elul is the time to feel guilty. 
and to feel terrible about ourselves. And that's the, that's the necessary step in, uh, in preparing ourselves for the holy, for the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is to simply go through uh, all of the mistakes we've made in life or made all the mistakes we made in the past year and feel terrible about them. And uh, maybe that would be a path that some would call the path of Musa. But uh, the Hasidic approach is different. So I want to talk a little bit about the Hasidic approach to the month we are in. From a, from a Kabbalistic, Hasidic, but joyous perspective. So let's look at the history of this month. Um, why is it that we should start preparing ourselves a month before Rosh Hashanah? I mean, uh, you know, I guess a month is a practical unit in time, but is that it? Is that it? It's simply that, you know, let's just randomly choose an amount of time to prepare ourselves for, and let's call it a month. What about a week? What about 10 days? What about 20 days? Why, why, why a month before um, Rosh Hashanah is the appropriate, would be the appropriate time to prepare? So the truth is that there's a, there's a historical uh, reason for this, and that is that we have to go back to the very beginning, to the first Yom Kippur and the first year in which the Jewish people were a people. What was the first year of Jewish existence? So even though we have the first Jew typically is, is Avraham and Sarah, they're the first Jews. But Judaism as a nation, as an identity, as a, as a system of law begins at the giving of Torah at Sinai. That's when Judaism begins as a, as a Torah system. So what happens? What happens is the Jewish people go out of Egypt. 49 days later, they receive the Torah at Sinai, right? We count the 49 days on the 6th of Sivan. We have the giving of the Ten Commandments at Sinai. And the very next day, Moshe, Moses goes up the mountain and says, I will be back in 40 days and I'll be back with the rest of the Torah, the rest of the story. Moshe Rabbeinu returns 40 days later. Obviously, we're moving quickly through this. Moshe Rabbeinu returns 40 days later. He has the divine tablets with him. And as he comes down from the mountain, who's there to meet him? Not the Jewish people, but a single person named Yehoshua, Joshua, who's there for him. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, at this point, he already knows because God, so to say, gave him a heads up. And he says, what's the uh, partying I hear behind you? And Yehoshua is not sure about it. And as it turns out, it's the party around the golden calf. And Moshe Rabbeinu famously takes the, takes the luchos, the tablets, vayashlichem, and he throws them. He sends them and he smashes them. And this is the, uh, the terrible sin of the golden calf. It is a sin which reverberates throughout all of history. And um, so Mo God's immediate response is to tell Moshe, I don't need these people. I gave, I, I revealed myself to them at Sinai and I spoke to them, a revelation which was unprecedented. A revelation which really has no has no uh, parallel afterwards, and says I spoke to them and I said Anochi Hashem Elokecha I am the Lord your God, and now forty days later they're already worshiping a golden calf. I have no need for such a people. In fact, God says I'll destroy them and I will turn you into a great nation. And then what happens is Moshe Rabbeinu, after breaking the luchos, he goes right back up onto the mountain. The breaking of luchos happened on the seventeenth of Tammuz. So again, the Torah was given this the Ten Commandments on the sixth of. Uh, Sivan, Moshe goes up on the 7th of Sivan, 40 days later, on the 17th of Thomas, he comes down, breaks the luchos, and then he goes up, and there's a process then, a few days, and he goes up two days later, back up to God, and for 40 days, and he spends another 40 days up on the mountain, and the goal of these 40 days is to convince, so to say, or to defend the Jewish people to God, and to plead with God not to destroy them. And Moshe Rabbeinu is successful. In this regard, Moshe Rabbeinu is successful in, in, in defending the Jewish people. And God says, okay, they will not be destroyed. Fine. Moshe Rabbeinu then comes back down from the mountain. This is now a couple of days before uh, the, the very end of the month of Av. Again, we have Sivan, followed by Tammuz, followed by Av. At the end of the month of Menachem Av, Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from the mountain, having succeeded at his agenda of defending the Jewish people. But then Moshe Rabbeinu goes back up. Rosh Chodesh El, on the first of El, Moshe Rabbeinu goes back up onto the mountain and he spends another 40 days there. Now, what is he accomplishing during these 40 days? Here it says he's turning to God and he's asking God again for forgiveness. Now, you may ask, why do you need forgiveness if forgiveness was already achieved? 
Moshe Rabbeinu already achieved the fact. God said, I, I got threatened so, to destroy the Jewish people. Moshe Rabbeinu um, was able to defend the Jewish people, overturned that, that decree. So now what, what's the next 40 days all about? So here's where we have something very profound. That is that, those 40 days, which again, Rosh Chodesh El, which was simply, which we, which we celebrated just two days ago. All the way 40 days after Rosh Chodesh El is Yom Kippur. During these 40 days, God's Moshe says, I don't just want forgiveness in the sense that you won't destroy the people, but I want you to forgive them to the degree that you love them just as you did before they committed this sin. And that is, that is the goal of these 40 days, which is very important because often when we think of forgiveness, we think of it, we think of it in terms of either I am angry or I forgave someone. Either I hold a grudge and I want to take revenge or I have forgiven them and I don't want to take revenge. But here you see very clearly that, no, there's yes, mechila, yes, mechila. There is forgiveness and there's other forgiveness. There's forgiveness in the sense of that they will not, that I will not punish someone for their actions. I will not take revenge against them. And then there's an entirely different level of forgiveness in which we say that I now love that person who hurt me or who hurt someone I loved. I love them and I am as connected to them as I was before the mistake happened. It's a very different level. It is a, it is a place, it's coming from a place asking such forgiveness. Think about not, we've been speaking in terms of the one who gives forgiveness, but think about from the terms of the one who asks forgiveness. There's two different ways I could be asking forgiveness. One is I could be standing in front of a judge and I'm saying, judge, I know that I've done something wrong and you are going and, you, and you're going to sentence me to some sort of punishment. Please forgive me. Where is that request coming from? It's coming from a place that I don't want to be punished. So that's where that request is coming from. What there's, an, there's a different the request for forgiveness could be coming from a different place entirely. And that is that there's no threat of punishment. There's no threat of revenge. But nevertheless, I turn to the person or to the judge or to someone I've hurt, and I say, just forgive me, not because I'm, a fear, I'm afraid of any consequence, but simply because I want to experience the closeness and the love with you as it existed before I committed this mistake. That's what I want. And this is, the, this is what Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to accomplish in this second set of 40 days really it's a third set of 40 days again yeah, the first set of 40 days that he was on the mountain he received the Torah that's before any mistake happened second set of 40 days was when he was uh when he was asking again defending the Jewish people hoping to overcome the the uh the threat of destruction and it's a third set of 40 days which is something else entirely which Moshe says we're, not, we're no longer afraid of any sort of punishment we simply want your closeness as you were, as it existed before the sin of the golden calf, we want to experience that closeness again. And here too, Moshe was successful. How do we know he was successful? First, because God said so, but also by demonstration that God sent Moshe down. What happens when Moshe Rabbeinu returns on that third set of 40 days? He comes down with the second set of luchos, the second set of tablets. The idea of the second set of tablets symbolized that God says, I am now giving you the same opportunity I gave you before you committed a sin, which I sent Moshe down with tablets. I'm giving you that same opportunity again. And therefore, not only that, our sages tell us that the second set of tablets actually contain greater potential than the first set. The first set of tablets only contained the potential of the written Torah. And the second set of tablets included not just the written Torah, but also the, uh, the, the oral Torah, which came afterwards. So this is the accomplishment of what happens on the, uh, with the second set of tablets. But all this brings us back to our initial question, which is, what are we celebrating during the month of El? And why do we start the preparation a month in advance? Why not a week in advance? Why not two months in advance? So the answer is because we have history over here. In Judaism, every, you know, when, when something happens initially in history, it creates it creates an opportunity and an energy forever. So, you know, when we, uh, you know, this is true about every holiday. Maybe this is an important preface for the holiday season. And that is that when we celebrate Pesach, Passover, we're not commemorating, we're not simply commemorating an event that happened thousands of years ago. Our belief is that because redemption happened on this day, 
3,000 years ago, God gives the possibility and the opportunity of redemption every year on that day. Because we don't we, we don't believe in Judaism is not a series. Judaism is not a, the Jewish calendar is not a series of memorial days. We're not commemorating the Exodus, commemorating the giving of the Torah, commemorating sitting in the in the in the uh, the clouds of glory in the uh, in the desert, commemorating the Maccabees, commemorating the story of Haman and Esther. Each of these events, yes, we remember something that happened, but much more profoundly, we believe that. Once the ener that energy was put into the world on that day, thousands of years ago, that energy it can be experienced every single year. So on Pesach, we could tap into the energy of freedom, which, which, is, which is given to the world on that day. On, Suk on Shavuos, we could tap into a new energy of Torah, which is, which is brought into the world on that day. And in Purim, a new, every, every holiday has its own energy, which we're not remembering, we're experiencing. And if that's the case, when it comes to the month of El, just as, again, in that first year, Elul was the month. That's when Moshe Rabbeinu went up onto the mountain that third time. And again, the goal was forgiveness. But it's important to emphasize, not forgiveness in the sense that we don't want to be punished, but forgiveness from a place of love, that we want that love which, we, which, which was experienced before our mistake, we want that love again. And therefore, that energy exists every year during this time. So you have to take advantage of it. It's an energy in the air. How can you not take advantage of the opportunity of tshuva, the opportunity of, of closeness to God, which, is, which exists during this month? And by the way, think, if you think about it, it's a pretty radical idea. It's a pretty radical idea that we believe and we are confident that not only can we petition to God, that we not be punished for our mistakes, that we not feel the consequences of our errors, but that even though we've done things wrong, we have absolute belief that if we turn to God sincerely, then God says, not only will you not have to deal with any consequences, but the love and the closeness will exist as if you never committed such a mistake. And we are to think in our lives about people who have done things to us, people who have harmed us, People have said things to us which have hurt our feelings. You know, how can we honestly say, especially if it's in a profound way, can we honestly say that it is easy to forgive and not just to forgive in the sense that I won't do anything, take any revenge, but rather I love them as if that comment wasn't said, as if that action wasn't taken, as if the harm or as if the abuse was never done. It's very difficult. As a human being, it's very difficult, to, again, especially if someone abused me in, 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 a, in a way which is serious, to be able to say that I am able to overlook it, not just overlook it, but that, I, that my feelings for them is as if it never happened. It's very difficult. And yet we believe, because God tells us so, we believe that we can accomplish that with God. And this is the month. This is the month in which we can accomplish it. So it's a month of repentance, but it's not a month of guilt. That's why I go back to the initial point I made where some look at El as a month in which let me take a list and write down all the things I've done wrong and, uh, and feel guilty about it. It's not what it's about. It's about a, a month of opportunity. It's the month of opportunity that, that I can uh, re reconnect to God in a way as if the mistake never happened. And we really have to take advantage of that. So let me share a few ideas connected to El. That, that I think is the general umbrella of what El is about. And now we'll share different ideas connected to the month, which, uh, which will bring us back to the same idea. So some of you may be familiar with the idea that when it comes to the Hebrew month of Elul, our sages find different uh, hints, allusions within the actual Hebrew letters of the month, the Hebrew letters of the, of the name of the month. So the name of the month is Elul, um, which is spelled Aleph Lamed Vav Lamed. The Hebrew letter is Aleph Lamed Vav Lamed. I'm going to share, and I'm using a phone over here to teach this, but I'll hopefully I'll try to share an image over here, which will allow us to, uh, to, to understand this a little bit more. The Hebrew, just a moment, pull this up. Okay, so, so, so here you have a picture in front of you, which spells out the letter. So in the center of the bottom of the image, you have the Hebrew word Elul. The left-hand side is spelled out in English, E-L-U-L. -L. In, he in Hebrew, it is Aleph, Lamed, Vav, Lamed. In Judaism, we, uh, we pay close attention to the letters. The letters are very significant, the Hebrew letters. 
We believe there's divinity in the Hebrew letters. The Hebrew letters of your, the letters of your Hebrew name contain spiritual energy. That's why it's very important to know your Hebrew name. And uh, when we pray for someone, we pray, we use their Hebrew name because there is spiritual energy attached to one's, to the Hebrew letters. We believe God created the world with the Hebrew letters. So here we have the, uh, the letters Elo, Aleph, Lamed, Vav, Lamed. Of all the months of the calendar, no month, no, no Hebrew name of a month gets more attention than the month of Elo. And we find numerous ideas connected to the month, the most famous of which is right here in front of you. Because you see on top of the word Elul, we have four words which spell out the first letters of those four words spell out the month Elul. Those four words are Ani, Lidodi, Vidodi, Li. I am, in the English translation, I see on the very top of this image, it's not perfectly accurate. The English translation says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. But the perhaps the more accurate translation would mean would be, I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. And this is a verse from Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs, King Solomon's Song of Songs, uh, which is a romantic description. If you read the book Song of Songs, uh, especially if you read it in Hebrew, it's a very romantic description of love between a bride and a groom or a husband and a wife. And the sages explained that King Solomon was describing how our love to God should be. Our love to God should be as palpable, as real, as romantic, as exciting as the love between a bride and a groom as they are about to be married. That love, that excitement, that passion, that's how we are supposed to relate to God. In fact, that's why King Solomon wrote it that way. It's so that we shouldn't, um, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't think of our relationship with God as something very abstract and spiritual and unrelatable. He says, no, you should relate. When we talk about loving God, which we say, love God with all your heart and all your soul, you should relate to that just as we relate to the romance that can exist between a man and a woman, the great love that can exist. That's how we're supposed to understand God. So when, when, when King Solomon, one of those verses, King Solomon says, Ani ladodi bidodi li, I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. Whoops, I'm sorry. I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. That's Rosh Tevis El. That's the acronym for the month of El. So what do we see from here? Again, goes back to the point we made. El on the one hand, on the one hand, it is a month of calculation. It is a month of reflection. It's a month in which we are supposed to think about where we came from, what we've done during the past year, how we can be better, what areas of our life we should change, but not from a place of guilt, not from a sense of I'm a terrible person, but rather I am to my beloved. I am to my beloved. And in this case, this is God. My beloved is to me. And therefore, it's, it's, it's coming from a place not of fear or a concern of punishment, but I want to reestablish a connection of love that existed at some point, and perhaps mistakes that I've made have gotten in the way of that, and now I'd like to reconnect. I'd like to feel that closeness again. That's L. That's the acronym for the month of L. Based on this, I'll share, I know there's, there's a lot to share, but I think the idea was a, was a half hour of discussion. So we only, we, well, we only have about five minutes left. I want to share another point, another rather, uh, another idea, which is, you, which is a Hasidic concept, which is brought up. It is taught by the Alter Rebbe of Shneir Zalman of Liadi, but it perhaps goes further back even to the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, who gives, who gives an interesting uh, parable to explain what the month of Elul is all about. You may have heard that there's a Hasidic idea that Elul, the idea of this month is called Melech Basada, which means the king is in the field. The Alta Rabbi, when he writes about the month of Elul, he poses the following question. He says, the month of Elul is a month of such great divine closeness, divine revelation, which is really unparalleled throughout the rest of the year. It's the month, as he says, of Hiskalos Yud Gimel Midot Rachamim, the revelation of the 13 attributes of God's mercy. God's mercy is always there, just as we are all, but it's the month in which that mercy is more revealed. I think we can relate to that. In other words, we all have elements within ourselves, which we are merciful. 
But it's sometimes that feeling of mercy, that feeling of compassion is stronger than others. So this month is a month of divine compassion. Says the Alter Rebbe, he says, if that's the case, shouldn't it be a month long holiday? Why is it, why is it called Chol? It's weekdays. Shouldn't it be a month long holiday? Now I get a month long holiday could have technical ramifications and difficulties as to how to observe a holiday for a month long, especially if we eat during this month, the way we eat on holidays, that would be extremely unhealthy. But that's that's a technical reason. What could be the um, what what would be the what, you know if if there is added holiness during this month, it should be a month long holiday. And the answer to the question he gives by way of a parable. He says, hey, under, under understand this question, we have to explain it by way of a parable. The parable is the king in the field. He says that uh, there was a king, and uh, in ancient days, you know, today's perhaps a little bit more difficult to understand the the novelty of what a king, a royal king was. But he says there was a king who lived in a, in a beautiful palace. And this king was someone who loved his subjects. He loved all of the people of his kingdom. He cared about them deeply. And he had a problem. The problem was that in his palace, it was very difficult for people to have access, understandably, to have access to the palace. Very few people could come visit him on a, on a, on a regular basis. Those who could come had to be royal dignitaries or had to, had to make all sorts of arrangements to come see him. And the king felt terrible because he never had a chance to really connect with his subjects because uh, the exclusivity of his palace. And I think even today, as as we uh, think about this, you know, today in our world today, even when you don't see someone, but uh, today there's all sorts of ways to know who they are. You have imagery, you have media, so you may not see the, uh, you may not actually come in contact with the president of the United States, but you see his face every single day on the news and on social media, you see their face every day. Uh, a couple hundred years ago, the, 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 uh, the, the farmer in the field, not only didn't get a chance to see the king, perhaps didn't know what the king looked like because they, there was no imagery, there was no pictures out there, there was no newspapers with, with pictures. So the, the distance between the farmer in the field and the king was actually very vast. Again, to the degree that maybe he didn't even know what the king looked like. And the king felt terrible about this. So the king said, I want to have this opportunity to see everyone. The king set up a date and he set up a time in which he told the, he notified the king, he notified the people that he's going to go out to them. He's going to go to their, to their places of work, to their fields, to where they work, and they can all gather there and everyone is welcome. There's no, it's, there's no VIP list. Anybody is, is welcome to come out to the field and to greet him there. And sure enough, that's what he does. And he goes out and the crowds gather and they amass to see him, and he comes out there with his uh, comes out with his with his wagon. And you can imagine the excitement as they they see the wagon approaching the distance, and the king steps out, and the king is excited and happy because he loves his people, and he's uh, and he's and he and he allows and he creates that relationship, that connection with all of the people in the field, without the challenges of meeting the king in the palace. Says the Alter this is the story of El. The story of El is the uh, is this the opportunity that God provides again. Not every parable is exact. Every parable is lacking in some areas. And obviously, to say that we can't access God throughout the year is incorrect. But nevertheless, there is a month in the year in which God says, I'm going to go to you in your place. I'm going to give an added degree of, of, of revelation, of closeness, of love. It's not just about coming to visit you. It's with the joy and with the happiness and with the smile. You know, my father often shares that the perhaps the, the closest understanding, the way closest he saw to this idea was was uh, the president years ago when the president was running for for re-election so he came out to, to michigan and he went to a field and there was this big gathering to meet the, the to go see the president in the field he says it was very interesting because he saw the analogies of this parable that was given but there's a very significant difference there's a significant difference between the parable which the alter rabbi is teaching us about the king in the field and the example of the president seeking re-election who's coming to the field the difference is that the president who comes out to the field to seek for re-election, re the reason they're coming out is not necessarily because they love the people, because, because they want their job. They want to know that they could uh, continue as the leader. As opposed to the story of Elul, there's no agenda. God's agenda is simply to create a loving connection with the people. And that's the parable given for the month that we are in. The month of, uh, the month of Elul is the month of, of, of in which God comes to the field and says, here's the opportunity to reconnect, which again brings us back to the point of El, yes, it's a month of it's a month of calculation. Yes, it's called the month of Cheshbon, a month of of taking stock of our actions during the past year. 
And, but it's not a month of guilt. It's a month of when I realized the mistakes I made. But I also recognized the opportunity, just as it existed the first Elul, 3,300 years ago, where Moshe, where Moshe went up on the mountain. Again, not to convince God not to punish the people. That was already accomplished. The avoidance of the punishment was already accomplished. Now it was just the next step, which is to create that loving relationship. So that's what happens every single year. And this is the idea of, uh, this is the way we're supposed to look at the month of Elul. It's a month of opportunity. It's a month of recognizing the tremendous opportunity of tshuva, of repentance, of closeness, of reconnection to God, which uh, which is provided to us, again, as the king is in the field. Just to conclude with a little anecdote from Rebbe, one of the great Hasidic masters, a colleague, a colleague of uh, of of the Alter Rebbe. Again, we just pointed out, Shneir Zaman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, who shared the, the parable of the king in the field. One of his colleagues was a man whose name was Rebbe Levi Yitzhak of Bardichev. Rebbe Yitzhak of Bardichev, was, uh, was a great Hasidic leader and who also had a great love for, for, for Jewish people. And he would always highlight their, their, their goodness, even their simpletons. So um, um, he shared the following. He said he was once walking late at night and through the city of Bardicha where he lived. And he overheard as he passed, passed by a house, he overheard a conversation between uh, the tailor and the tailor's wife. And the tailor's wife called out to the tailor and she said, it's late, it's nighttime, it's time to go to bed. And the tailor, he heard him respond, Rebbe says, I heard the tailor respond to his wife and, she, and he said, the candle is still burning, I can still mend things. The candle is still burning, there's still some lights, so I can still mend the materials that I'm working on. Rebbe walked on and he said, that was a lesson for me that in life, that as long as the candle is burning, as long as the neshama is the soul, as long as we wake up in the morning and waking up in the morning is God's way of saying your candle is still burning, your soul is still burning. So there's still time to mend things. One should never look back and think of mistakes we made and think that is in Yiddish we say fartik. It's never, it's never too late. If the candle still burns, if the light of the neshama still burns, then there's still opportunity to mend things. And this is the month to do it. This is the month as we prepare for Rosh Hashanah is to mend things and recognize the awesome and beautiful opportunity that God gives us to reconnect and create a loving a love that existed before any mistakes. And maybe as we'll get to in the future weeks, a love that may be even greater through that when we return after our mistakes, the love that happens because of that is greater than the opportunity we had before we made mistakes. All right, that way we conclude this discussion. Wishing everyone a Chodesh Tov. We also starting from already at this point, we wish one another may be written and inscribed for a happy and sweet new year.